I, I've uh, I put at the top of the story should I put the verse that we're going to be looking at. And just a reminder, every week we're looking at next next week's portion. Okay? So this is taken from not this past week, Chayi Sarah. This is taken from next week, which is, uh, which is Parshat Toldot. In it, among other things, is the story of the birth of Yaakov and Esav and their struggle throughout, throughout their lives or for the first, uh, first few stages of their lives, including the whole episode when, um, when Yaakov cheats his father, lies to him, masquerades as Esav, that whole episode. But leading up to the leading up to the whole Asav making you know making believe that he's Yaakov making believe that he's Asav stealing the blessings and that whole episode, one of the things that enables that to happen, let me ask you guys, what enables that trickery and that whole act to happen? What allows that physically, technically, what what enables that trick to take place? The mother, she's the one who come up, comes up with the idea. Correct. The fact that Yitzhak is blind. Without Yitzhak being blind, obviously, Yaakov would not be able to masquerade as, masquerade as Esav. So, that's what we're going to be focusing on. The Midrash talking about that. So, if you look at the top of the story sheet, again, as we've done in the past, usually with Midrash, we're not looking at a lot of psukim looking at one, two, three verses at most, and the Midrashim on a parsha are not necessarily, or they're not a one long consistent um, um, style or one long commentary, as we saw, let's say, with the Arberbanel or the Malbim, or even with Rashi. Even Rashi um, will come and give pieces here and there on one versus two verses, but he still, but he still usually tries to make it fit in with the larger picture, at least to some degree. Medrash, each medrash exists completely on its own. Not only that each verse exists on its own, but even every verse can have any one verse can have three, four, five, six, eight midrashim that have nothing to do with each other. That has to do with one of the ways in which midrash works. Okay, let's start. Says the pasuk when. Yitzchak was old, and his eyes were too dim from seeing. He called his older son Esav and said to him, My son. He answered, Here I am. Okay, questions? Let's read it again. When Yitzchak was old... And his eyes were too dim from seeing. He called his older son Esav and said to him, My son, he answered, Here I am. Questions? Okay. So at this point, okay, at, this, at this point with the verse, we don't know, we don't even know yet what is Officially, we don't know what's about to happen. There are certain questions that I think that, that merit asking, even without knowing. Your question is obviously a very good one, but your question assumes we know the continuation, which is, oh, he's about to say to Esav, go hunt for me so I can bless you. And then obviously the question is, why Esav, why not Yaakov, etc. But remember, Medrash sometimes, many times, will be looking at a verse Completely on its own. It will sometimes also look at it in a wider context. But let's try to ask questions based on the only on the verse we're looking at. And remember, we have to remember, as we said two weeks ago and last week, Midrash is the first commentary ever written on the Torah. So when, when, when this Midrash is being, or the rabbis are looking at this Pasuk, they don't have any other texts, any other formal commentary written, codified commentary to lean on or to rely on. Anything else disturbing about this verse? Yes. Uh, yes, Oleg. Correct. Correct. 
Okay. So, so yes. So that. Wait, 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 wait. Just one second. I want to just explain. I want to. The language here. Yes, you're right. That's what. That's one of. The, that is what the midrash is going to pick up on. The phrasing. Now, this phrasing, this as it's written here in English, is my translation. You won't find it anywhere else. It's my. Tra- I translated it because because the midrash is picking up here on the literal way in which it's phrased in Hebrew, which it doesn't translate well into English. But when we see the midrash, but in, in Hebrew, in Hebrew it says merot. In the most literal way that should be translated as I wrote it, I too dim from seeing. And that is a very, very strange phrasing. So you've picked up on, that is what the Midrash is going to be focusing on. Yes. Right, so you say, what you're saying is that the opening here is more than just stating a technical fact. This, it is, it is uh, setting the stage for everything that's about to happen. Absolutely, yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, because you're sitting a little further back, I have difficulty hearing you. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Remember, we're coming. <laughs> we we have to we have to be very, very careful. What you're doing is you're jumping to the you're jumping to the end. Okay? Because when you look at this verse, meaning just to repeat the question for those who are who are watching us live, the question was that it see that from the verse it seems that the reason for his blindness is his old age, but isn't it true? that his blindness is because of what happened in the Akedah. So I'm going to challenge you in saying, based on what? Does it say in this verse anything about the Akedah? Did it say anything in the Akedah itself about Yitzchak becoming blind? No. So, so as, as always, we need to be very, very careful when coming to look at a, at a verse and, and to consider what... What are we relying on when we come to ask a question, when we come to answer a question? So, the, so, so one of the Midrashim, or a portion of the Midrash that we're going to see, is going to bring up that exact point. But that's where we have to be very, very careful. Caref- that's where we need to be. What? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear I can hear you. I think now it should be okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? How how how's the connection now? Can you can, can you hear me now? Wait. Is not, not, now it's okay? Okay. Okay, uh, maybe the, we had a bit of an issue with the connection, now we're okay. Um, okay, so as I was saying, we need to be very, very careful to differentiate between what the Psukim are saying and what Midrash is saying. Now again, this is a class about Midrash, but we don't start off assuming that the verse is saying the Midrash. It's a very big leap, and that's a leap that we're, that we're going to try to understand. How did Chazal get from what the text is saying to the story that you're quoting about the Akedah? Where did that come from? Does that make sense? What are they trying to do here? But that's, one, that's some of what we're going to see. Okay, so 
Our main question is the one which Oleg pointed out, which is the phrasing here, um, the phrasing here of, uh, uh, which is very strange, that his eyes were dim from seeing. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start the Midrash. We're going to see the Midrash is going to bring three different answers to explain this phrasing. And we're going to see that these three different answers, um, they start off by trying to give an answer to a, to, to give a, a technical answer to a question that we have, to a difficulty that we have. But we'll see that, uh, as we always do, after we understand how the commentary answers the question, we then come and say, okay, is the, is the commentary doing more than just answering a technical question? Is everyone with me? People can hear me? Okay, great. Um, let me just see. Okay. Let's start. Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria said, from seeing, right, that's the phrase that is difficult for us. What does that mean? His eyes became dim from seeing. From seeing what, right? Seems to be denoting that from that he saw something. It almost seems to, the, 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 the pshat, the, the most literal way to understand the verse, it seems that he saw something that caused him to become blind, right? From seeing, mirot. Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria said, from seeing evil, from seeing the wickedness of the evil, the Holy One, blessed be He, said, Yitzchak will go out to the market, and people will say, there is the father of that, of that wicked man. Rather, I will dim his eyes, and he will sit in his house. That is what is written, when the wicked rise, man will hide. This is another phenomena about Midrash that we've said in our first class, that many times Midrash will quote it as, uh, as a source um, to support the interpretation. It will quote verses from uh, Mishle, Proverbs, Tehillim, or from, uh, or from Eov, which is a, a topic we'll find a time to address. But these, uh, but, so this is the first explanation that the Midrash gives. Yes. Correct. So, so, right. <laughs> okay. So let me just let me just repeat the point that was mentioned here, which is that I made it sound beforehand as if Medrash is acting on a you know on the context of a clean slate, as Medrash is relying on nothing but the uh, text itself. But over here, the fact that this Medrash, although uh, the Medrash is being very literal, that um, that uh, um, that that in order to not to see, right, you know, it, it explains, it gives a good answer to the phrasing from seeing, but in the text itself, we don't know that Esav is evil. Nowhere does it explicitly say that, and it's really only through Midrashim, and if you go according to the most literal sense and the pshat of the psukim, not only does Esav not seem evil, I, I wouldn't necessarily say he seems like he's a tzaddik, but... Neutral, definitely neutral. We don't see we don't see him being evil. We don't see him to, we don't see him being righteous. Um, wait, Alex, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, fine. Okay, D just double checking. Um, so, Daniel, I, I I'm not I, I I'll take a step back. I don't think that Medrash is operating from a clean slate because we will see later on a very important. Midrash that I think is very, very revealing about how, method, how Midrash works. So it's not acting in a clean slate. That's why I said before that it's acting without any written texts. It's not, meaning the, the rabbis of the Midrash are not, do not have books and do not have codified Midrash and commentary based on which they're relying. They do have an oral tradition. They do have bits and pieces of, of traditions and of stories and of interpretations, they're not codified, they're not written down anywhere, they're oral. So, yes, I agree with you. And this, this, this Rabbi, Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah 
is relying in his Midrash on an understanding that Esav was evil, which is what we see in other Midrashim as well. So I will concede that. Okay. So, um, now, so let's, yes. Yes. Yes, wait, wait, wait. First of all, it's not the first Midrash. All of what we have here is one big Midrash. Okay? It's the first explanation of the Midrash. And, and, and what, so, so, the first question we have is, did the Midrash answer our question? Did, yeah, yeah, what? it did. It answered. What is, why does the verse say that his eyes were too dim from seeing? From seeing evil, Hashem, Hashem, Hashem made him blind in order to protect him from seeing evil. Right. So we have we have an answer to our question, but obviously this leads us to to this leads us to a new question. What question does this raise? What question does this, as far as the idea of this Midrash? There's something quite troubling about the idea of this Midrash. Yes. No, the question was, did, did, didn't Yitzchak know from beforehand already that Esav was, uh, Eve was uh, wicked? Not necessarily. Again, remember in the ver- in the verses themselves, we don't see any wrongdoing of Esau. We don't see any problem. Any. So right. So so the one troubling thing here is well, no, well, no. But Oleg, our assumption here is that Yitzchak, Yitzchak doesn't know, right? God makes him blind in order not to see Esau's wickedness, in order for, for Yitzchak not to be identified as the father of a wicked person and the humiliation that goes with that. And therefore, Hashem, and therefore Hashem t- takes mercy on Yitzchak and makes him blind. You're saying, following that logic, you need to make him deaf. Why? But because back then, I guess, a blind person would never leave the house. Especially if they're old, they would stay home. So how would Yitzchak... What? Right. Okay. So Oleg, again, is that's, that is the pertinent question, which is a question about Medrash in general, which is, there's something unrealistic about the explanation. The Midrash is making believe it's giving an answer, like an, an, a real answer which is supposed to fit with the logical world, so to say. But there's, I actually thought of a different problem, Oleg, but it's the same type. You're saying there's something, it's, it, 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 it's, not, it's, not, it's not a good enough answer. It doesn't make so much sense. I Meaning, did Chazal really think that this answer really answers the question. No, because, what, he's not going to find out some other way? What, Yitzchak doesn't host anyone in his house? No one's going to say to him, you know, he's not going to hear anything? What, he's blind, so he, he, what, he never left his tent for decades? From the moment he became blind, he stayed in his tent for decades? Probably not a very realistic explanation. I don't have another, another question, which is, I have, a, I, have a, I have a more fundamental problem with the Midrash. You're saying in order to protect Yitzchak from being mocked or, be, or suffering the shame of his wicked son, Hashem did him a favor and made him blind. Yeah, but... But but I'm not raising that as an answer. I'm raising that as a question. That is a very problematic concept. He's saying that God made him made Yitzchak blind as a fa- in, as a favor. 
Like, thanks a lot. Like, you know what? What would you prefer? I don't know. Maybe this is tricky. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. What would I prefer, you know, to find out, which, as Oleg says, I probably will find out anyway, but to uh, suffer the shame of a son who is wicked, or to be blind for decades, decades. This is not for a year or two. To be blind for decades. I, I don't know. I think I would prefer to still have my eyesight then, 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 then to continue living in a make-believe world about my, the behavior of my child. So the Medrash, again, we've seen this a lot with commentary, that the commentary does give an answer on the, on the initial kind of fundamental level, but opens up a whole other realm of, of questions. That's fine. We're, we're going we're gonna to get there. We'll see that this Medrash has a lot more to it than, than, than meets the eye. And the answer to what the Midrash is actually trying to do lies in the weakness pointed out by these questions. Let's continue to the second, the, the second uh, explanation of the Midrash. Another explanation from seeing because of that seeing that when Avram Avinu bound his son upon the altar, the angels wept. That is what is written in Yeshayahu, the Arielites, that's a nickname for, that's one of the names of the angels, cry aloud, Shalom's messengers weep bitterly. Who is Shalom? Shalom is one of the nicknames, one of, one of God's nicknames. So this verse from Isaiah is proving that angels cry. Okay? And tears from their eyes fell into Yitzchak's eyes. They were sustained there, and when he became old, his eyes became dim. That is what is written, and it happened when Yitzchak became old, etc. Okay. Is the Medrash, is this second opinion answering the question? Yes, it's saying, what is it that he saw? That made him blind. The tears of the angels that fell into his eyes. Okay, so what do we think about this explanation? It's what? Right? Okay, yes. So wait, 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 you'll you'll have pause. Wait, 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 pause. I'll tell you why. Because you're taking this to the psychological realm. When I say pause, I mean wait for the third explanation. In the third explanation, what you're saying is going to be right on. But over here, it's not about psychology. What is it about? It's about biology. Not about psychology. Right? When we get... You'll, no, but you'll see. You're, you're definitely going in a, in, a, in, a, in a good direction. We'll see. The next explanation... It does exactly what you're doing, which takes to the to the realm of psychology, or we'll see beyond that even. But over here, it's giving a theoretically a biological explanation. It's saying a a, a physical, you know, he sustained some kind of physical injury, you know, some kind of physical thing that happened. Again, in the world of midrash, the midrash doesn't care. That this is mythical. And I'll, and I'll prove it. I will prove it at the end. I will prove that, that the rabbis of the Medrash were very, were very aware of the difference between, between realism 
and and uh, and the myth and and the mythical explanations and realist explanations. But as we've said, Medrash, Medrash's main point, and and we'll, I'll prove this soon, is not necessarily to make you believe that the angels actually were crying, and it doesn't necessarily necessitate believing in, you know. At first, I, I was thinking of calling this class uh, "Tears from Heaven," you know, "Tears of," you know, "Tears from Heaven," and having a picture of Eric Clapton on the. On the uh, on the website, um, so I don't think it necessitates believing that angels have have uh, have eyes and have uh, tear ducts, and that they sh- you know and that you know. Medrash, we'll see soon. Its attempt is not to give a objective, realist explanation. It's trying to give a deeper understanding and approach to the verses. We will see soon how it's doing this. But the second explanation, we understand, we understand the, the answer. The answer is the, 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 the angels cried and the tears fell into his eyes. And eventually, um, that uh, once his eyes became susceptible to injury, then that physical thing that happened to him many years ago, now took effect. Now, besides the, uh, the fact that this is mythical, what else is strange about this explanation? As if that's not enough. But what else is, the, is strange about this explanation? I'm sorry, say that again. I, I, can you please repeat what you said? So, um, yes, I agree. I'll just repeat what you said, which is this is a good example of where what happens in, the, in man's world is echoed in the heavens. But, but I actually was thinking about this exact point. It's exactly where I was, I, where I was hoping to go with it. But on the flip side, because we have here uh, an action which is happening up in heaven, not even by God himself, but by the angels, that's having an effect down here that we're not even aware of. That's only going to take effect in, you know, decades later. Okay, we're going to go with the third explanation. Uh, my, my, my difficulty with this is, like, why is this, how is this connected to the Akeda? Why, wh- wh- why is it specifically the Akeda that from there you're saying that, you know, the it just seems very, very random. Why would you say that the blindness that he suffers in his old age is related back to something that happened a, hu- a hundred years ago or something like that? Why connect it to the Akeda? Oh, like you're going to... Yeah, go ahead. Ooh, ooh. Okay. Wait, wait. Why is this? What, wait. Payback to who? Who is this payback to? But Avram, Avram, Avram's. Why is it payback to Avram? I like what you're saying, but I wanna, I wanna push you on it. Avram's dead. Avram's gone. Yitzchak uh, didn't do anything. So. Yitzchak, Yitzchak. 
why, why, why should Yitzchak, why does Yitzchak deserve to be punished for something from the Akedah? That should, it should be Avram. If you're talking about the ten, if you're referring to the tension, uh, no, no, don't give up so quickly, Oleg. I, I, I'm okay, possibly, and there are midrashim that do talk about such a thing, but the reason I'm pushing you is because when you'll see when we get to the last, the last one, which the last uh, approach, which is mind blowing. Yes. But wait, but wait, 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 are you giving, I mean, you're, you're giving an alternative explanation? Good. But, wait, but, no, no, but, 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 but the Midrash doesn't say that. The Midrash, meaning, the Midrash isn't, wait, the Midrash isn't missing, the Midrash is saying very explicitly what it means. There's a biological element here, which is the tears of the angels fell into Yitzchak's eyes, and years later, when his constitution became weaker with old age, that physical occurrence that happened back then had a, an effect and caused him to become blind. Meaning, the first wait, wait, the first explanation connects it to Esav. The second explanation is completely separate. It's not, it's not compounded on the first explanation. The second explanation says this is a result of what happened, you know, a hundred years ago or something like that. But I want, to go, I want to go to the third interpretation because in my mind it is the most beautiful one and we have to see it. So very, yes, very quickly. Again, we, we, listen, there's a lot of things that, a lot of, a lot of our own explanations we could possibly bring in, but I don't see that in the Midrash. Meaning the Midrash, this explanation in the Midrash does not connect it to Esav. The first, again, the fact that the first one did, and in this one, Esav's name is not mentioned at all, means that this is an, seems to be an independent explanation. Okay, let's go to the third one. Another explanation from seeing, because of that seeing, that when Avram Avinu bound his son upon the altar, by the way, notice that it, that is the exact same phrasing of the opening of the second explanation. But look what happens now. He raised his eyes to heaven and looked at the Shekhinah. Who? Who raised his eyes to heaven? No, Yitzchak. Yitzchak raised his eyes to heaven and looked at the Shekhinah. A mashal, a simile is given to what is this similar. Now for those of you who were, who were here for the first week, I ask you as we read this, does this sound familiar? To what is this similar? to a king that was walking at the entrance of his palace and raised his eyes and saw the son of his loved one peeking upon him through the window. He said, if I kill him now, I will defeat my loved one. Rather, I decree that his windows be sealed. In this way, when Avram Avinu bound his son upon the altar... He raised his eyes and looked at the Shekhinah. The Holy One, blessed be He, said, If I kill him now, I defeat Avram, my loved one. Rather, I decree that his eyes should become dim. 
and so when he became old, his eyes were dim. I could read this explanation 30 times and not get, get I could read it 30 times and not get tired. It is, it is beautiful. Okay, now, I don't know, anyone want to throw out your thoughts? What, what, what you understand from it? What, 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 what doesn't make sense about it? Before I give you my spiel, I want to hear what people have to say. Speaking. So you're saying, yeah, yeah, so I, I agree that that is the main the most troubling question, there are a lot, but the most troubling question of this approach is, why is looking at the Shekhinah something that merits being killed? Right? What's the answer that's given? That Yitzchak should have been killed all the way back then in the Akedah. He should have been killed. Remember, this, there's so much symbolism in this Midrash because he was about to be killed. Who was about to kill Yitzchak in the Akedah? Avram was about to kill him. Says Hashem, yes, but I should have killed him. He deserved to be killed. But I didn't want to cause Avram, who thought he was killing him himself, I didn't want to cause him pain. So I suspended Yitzchak's sentence. But why did Yitzchak deserve to be killed? Because he looked at the Shekhinah. But that's very strange. Why would Yitzchak deserve to be killed for looking at the Shekhinah? Any ideas? Anyone want to try to give an understanding of what this Medrash is doing? This, this explanation trying to do? By the way, I'll, 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 I'll just point out, does anyone here notice how this seems to play on the first Medrash we saw two weeks ago? Remember that Avram Avinu was walking and he saw a palace and he said, who is the master of the palace? And the king peeked, peeked upon him and said, I am the master of the palace. This seems to be playing on that same relationship. But this time the king, who's the king? Hashem is the one who's going out for a walk. And the son, who's Yitzchak, is high above, looking down upon him, peeking. There seems to be this weird kind of upside-down situation where Hashem is traveling, and, the, and, and instead of Avram wandering and looking, and, and then Hashem peeks upon him, you have Hashem doing the Akedah, Hashem is the one who's walking. Hashem is the one who's searching for something during the Akedah. And Yitzchak peeks upon him. I can't, I, I can't say I have fil- fully figured out how all the pieces fit together. But um, obvi- but I do want to go back. Wait, wait I want to before that, before I go back to the big picture. Um, it seems to be the, the simple explanation it's giving is, is that um, it's disrespectful for a kid to be peeking at, a, at the king. There are certain sights that you should, that are too awesome or too magnificent for a kid to be look. It's lowly. You're a little kid. You should not be peeking. I think you were right that the word peeking is a word which denotes like, you know, something that is wrong. You shouldn't be peeking. When the king is, you know, is taking his private stroll, it's almost it's like disrespectful. So it's trying to say that when Yitzchak is looking at the Shekhinah, 
There's something about it which is, you shouldn't be looking, right? When Moshe Rabbeinu comes and he uh, meets Hashem for the first time in the burning bush, it says he couldn't look, right? You know, you can't come too close, you can't look. Hashem says to Moshe, man cannot see me and live. We see many, many times in Torah this idea that you can't look directly at God's revelation, whatever, however we understand that revelation to mean. And Yitzchak has reached a level here where he is looking at the Shekhinah, meaning he's, he's gaining a closeness. He's gaining a closeness, an intimacy which is too much. But it kind of makes sense considering the situation that he's in. He is being sacrificed, as he is being offered as the greatest devotional offering. And therefore, um, he himself attains this tremendous level of, of closeness um, where he could peek upon Hashem. And that's why, and that's why, in the, in the, in the Pshat of the Midrash, the result, and this goes to the psychological explanation, that he experienced something so awesome and so, I guess, almost like traumatic, but positive traumatic, that it stays with him to the point where later on in life, it causes him to lose sight. Now, we have our first level of the Medrash. Our first level is, Let's, let's review before we get to the big idea. And I think in this, we, in this Midrash, there's a, a huge idea. The first level is the phrasing of the verse is hinting at something more. The, 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 the verse is forcing Chazal to ask and to explain what is the source, what is the cause of Yitzchak's blindness. And this goes to a fundamental Jewish idea, or a fundamental classic Jewish idea, that if something bad happens, there must be a reason. It is clear in Chazal's world that if something bad happened, there's a reason for it, and that it is justified or that it is a proper to search for the cause of for the for the cause. So the first explanation is what is the cause for the blindness, meaning why what is the cause of the blindness? It is a tragedy, but it, it hides a it, it hides mercy. The first one is saying to us that even though it seems like Yitzchak, something bad happened to him, really it's something good. It's to spare him the embarrassment. And this is a fundamental Jewish idea. But again, remember, until Metrash came and, says, and, and introduced these ideas, they weren't written down anywhere. So this could be one of the earliest sources for the very classic Jewish idea that sometimes when something seems like it's bad, if you look deep enough, you can find some good in it. You can find sometimes that what seems at first glance that it's, that, it's, that it's bad or that it's a tragedy, if you look well enough or you go and you search for the right explanation, there's actually it's that, that tragedy is, hi, is hiding a, a chesed, is hiding something which is good for you. That is a classic, classic idea that the Medrash here is introducing. Everyone with me? Good. The second one is coming and saying that sometimes man is not always in control and, 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 and don't worry because I will go, I will go deeper than this soon. We, w- we will go deeper than this. That sometimes a person can become blind because angels cry. A person can't know about angels crying. The second one is saying there are forces in this world which are not in our control and we sometimes have to accept that there are certain things that we cannot control 
And there are certain things that we will not be able to understand. There are heavenly forces, non-heavenly forces, that act upon us. And the Midrash, the second explanation, is just introducing that there is something that happened. It is not Yitzchak's fault. It is not anyone's fault. It's just that we are not man, we are not always in control. And that is part of how the world works. The third explanation comes and gives a psychological explanation, which is sometimes the bad things that happen to us, or bad things that happen, are a result of traumatic experiences. In this case, a, it gives a very specific type of traumatic experience, something that, that he experienced, a closeness, a, 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 again, traumatic, when I say traumatic, I mean because it stayed with him. And a hundred years later, it is still having an effect on him, so much so that it deprives him of his ability to see. So the Midrash on the, on the second tier here is saying that if, if Yitzhak became blind, then we need to search for a reason for it. Reason one is sometimes we're not always in control. There are forces that we don't always recognize that act upon us, and we need to accept that. Sec, uh, another option is the fact that something that looks bad sometimes is hiding a kindness that we don't always see. And the third is saying that sometimes it's even our own fault or our parents' fault, right? Because Yitzchak experienced a traumatic experience that stayed with him and he couldn't, couldn't shake it. He gained such a closeness. Think about it for a second. Think about the spiritual height and intensity that Yitzchak was at. Think about the drama. Think about the, think about the feelings that he had when he realized his father is going to sacrifice him and kill him and to agree to just let his father do that. Think about the devotion and the spiritual and psychological intensity that Yitzchak is experiencing at that, at that moment. And imagine what it's like to go on with life afterwards after experiencing being able to see the Shekhinah. And it, it makes sense that at some point in life, like trauma, you're stuck in a moment and you can't, and it, and it, and it drives you, I'm not, I'm not going to say it drives you crazy, but that it has a long-term psychological effect. And a long-term severe psychological effect, it's not surprising that it might also have biological uh, manifestations as well. Now, I, I think it's very important to go one step deeper. Because what we've done now is kind of explained how the Medrash here is giving, setting up the class, some of the most classic explanations about, about why bad things happen. One, we're not in control of everything. Two, something that looks bad could actually be hiding a, a kindness. And three, traumatic experiences that we have because of ourselves or our surroundings, they have long-term effects. But I personally have trouble with these type of explanations. I have difficulty when people come and say, oh, this bad thing happened, oh, he must have done something, she must have done something, it's the parents' fault. I think most people today have difficulty accepting this type of cause and effect explanation for bad things. And I think Medrash knows it as well. At, at the bottom of the source sheet is a Medrash which isn't directly connected, but it touches upon Oleg what you were saying at the beginning. About to what degree, of, of how, and this, and this point, and, and this point I'm going to say now, I think, in my mind, is the most important one as far as understanding what Midrash is. So earlier in the parsha, it says that Rivka 
feels right. It says that she feels that the that, that she feels that the baby or babies are are bouncing around in her womb. And it says that she vatelech lidroshet Hashem. She that she goes to beseech or to request from God to get an explanation of what's going on. Right, and that's when Hashem says, "Oh, you actually have two babies in your stomach." They are, they are going to be the forefathers of two nations, and therefore that's the tension that you're feeling, the battling amongst them. But on the phrase, she went to beseech or to search God, the Medrash says the following, the bottom of the page. And she went to inquire from Hashem. This is amazing. But were there shuls and houses of Torah study in those days? Why do I find this amazing? Because this proves that the rabbis of the Midrash had a full understanding of realism. They said, wait a second. The pasuk makes it sound as if she went to shul or went to the, went to the, to the, the study hall. But that's unrealistic says the Midrash. The Midrash says, it's unrealistic. There are no shuls. There are no Betay Midrash. There are no Torah, you know, study halls in the time of the Torah because the Torah wasn't given yet. This, this is one of many examples where you see that the rabbis of the Midrash had a very clear understanding of what is real and realistic and what is not real. Oh, like, you see what I mean? Meaning, them asking that, they're challenging the idea. It's like, you know, don't say to me that she went to Shul, to Davin, or she went to the Bet Midrash to ask the rabbis questions in the Bet Midrash, because that's unrealistic. The, the Midrash over here comes and says, rather, this comes to teach you, look at this, comes to teach you that anyone who beseeches the wise, it is as if he beseeches the Shekhinah. What this Medrash does, it reveals that the Medrash is not trying to describe a real event. It's trying to teach you a message. You, got, you, see, what I, you, see, you see what I'm saying? This Medrash is just one example. At the moment, this is not the same Medrash that we have, that we were talking about. But it proves that in the eyes of Midrash, the main point of Midrash is not to give a technical, physical explanation to events. Its main attempt is to teach you an idea. Now, that have been said. Meaning this proves that Chazal were not gullible. And they're not treating us as gullible. We said in the first class that there are two approaches to Midrash, two like extreme approaches. One, fairy tales, and two, deep explanations. Um, and this Midrash in my eyes reveals what Chachamim is saying, don't focus on the technical explanation, understand that there's a message. And if that's the case, then we need to go back to our three approaches of Midrash and come and say that it's not just, I think, trying to teach us, oh, Yitzchak must have become blind because there are forces that are out of our control. Yitzchak must have been become blind to, because every tragedy actually is kindness to spare him the shame of his son. Or he must have been because of the trauma that he experienced when he was a kid. I think there's a deeper thing happening here. And I'm not saying that this is in the Midrash. This is my, this right now is my, my attempt of getting out of the Midrash something even deeper. Because I think by the fact that the Midrash is bringing three different explanations, and each one of them is different, I think it's saying it's not a question of one of them is right and one of them is wrong. 
I think what the Midrash is trying to come and say, it's less about finding the reason, the cause of his blindness, and more about trying to give meaning and purpose to his blindness. I'll say that again, because I, I believe that it is a really extremely fundamental concept. I think what the Midrash, by bringing three contradictory explanations for the cause of his blindness, is, I think, hiding a deeper idea, which is, it's less about finding the technical, physical cause for his blindness and making it sound a little more palpable theologically. And I think it's a lot more about after the fact, giving it purpose. And the, and the difference between those two things is the difference between a person saying, why did this happen to me? Versus saying, now that it happened to me, what meaning am I going to give it? What does it mean to me? The first question, why did this happen to me, is a question that leaves a person stuck. I don't know. Maybe it's because coincidence, like the angels crying into my eyes. Maybe it's because of some vague, maybe it's hiding some vague generosity that I'll never know about. I, or, I don't know. If it's just about cause, why did this happen to me, a person is left stuck. I don't think that the Midrash is trying to just say, here is the objective cause for his blindness. Hidden generosity, you know, uncontrollable uh, forces, or psychological trauma from when he was a kid. I think Medrash is trying to say, here are three different possible explanations um, to reflect, to accept his blindness, to understand the meaning of his blindness. And I think that hides in a tremendously helpful and deep approach to how to view suffering, how to view trauma, how to view bad things that happen to us as individuals, as people. And it's a difference between saying, why did this happen to me? Versus saying, what does this mean to me? Because the question, what does this mean to me? Is Yitzhak saying, well, what is the meaning? What purpose could my blindness serve? Says the Midrash, his pur the pur a purpose that his blindness can serve is to spare him the shame of his son. The purpose that his blindness can serve is acceptance that there are things that are beyond our control. The purpose that his blindness can serve is understanding that if a person experiences a tremendous, tremendous experience, positive, negative or even positive, he might spend his entire life in the shadow of that event. And that, I think, is something extremely powerful that the Midrash is hiding. Again, not just trying to give an objective explanation to why it happened, but by giving three different explanations in the same Midrash, saying, here are three different potential ways to give meaning and purpose to the, to the blindness. Yes, Oleg. No. No. The, the. Correct. You're right. You're, you're right. So, oh look, oh look, you, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%, and it is uh, very, very, it, it, it fits very well with, with Yitzchak's character. Yitzchak is Mr. Acceptance. He's Mr., he is, Yitzchak is Mr. Acceptance. 
He accepts everything that happens to him. His father wants to wants to kill him. Fine. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't ask. He doesn't challenge. He doesn't get up and run away. Um, when his uh, when when uh, um, when when he when the wells that he dug were closed, he doesn't fight about it. He goes and he digs a different well. When his when when his when when his wife maneuvers him and his son lies to him and steals from him, he accepts it. He is Yitzchak is Mister Acceptance. But wait, wait, but Chazal, and by the way, there were people in Tanakh who did question when tragedy happened to them. Yov Job is the is the classic example. Tragedy hits him, and he challenges, and he says, why did this happen to me? And there are other people as well. But, 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 Chazal, remember, it's commentary. So even though they start off by trying to explain a technical anomaly or difficulty in the verse, like most commentary, it is an opportunity for them to give a deeper understanding and deeper uh, um, meaning to what is going on. And in their minds, there's a, deep, there's a very important question. Why did he become blind? And by giving three different answers, I don't think they're arguing with each other about the technical cause as much as what does it mean? What meaning is there to Yitzhak's blindness? And that, does, and, that, and that gives us three approaches which are powerful. Things are not always in, our, in human control. Um, sometimes things that st- that look bad are, could be good. And three, there's we, we drag with us trauma from our, throughout our entire life. But more importantly, they hide the search for the meaning of the event is the most important point here. Yeah. What? You're, you're right. So no, no, you're right. So a, no, 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 no. So so all, what all, what Oleg is saying, what Oleg is saying, is where's the, there should be an obvious another explanation that God made him blind or he became blind in order to allow for the next stage of the story to take place, which is for Yaakov to trick to trick him into giving him the blessings. Right without without Yitzchak um, becoming blind, so I'd say two things. One, um, there is another midrash that does say that. That does say that. Um, um, the second thing, um, wait, I'm going to say the first thing is another midrash said that, but for whatever reason, this midrash did not bring it in there. Um, Possibly, again, possibly because this one, I think, is trying to give three different fundamental approaches to the view of suffering. And the idea that, how, I mean, what meaning could it, I guess, no, you know what, I guess, I guess a person could say, there's meaning in suffering because it serves someone else's, someone else's purpose. Meaning, it's worth it for me to suffer because it's going to help someone else. So, you're right, it could have appeared here. The the medrash in a different place does bring that reason. That's exactly that's exactly exactly what I'm saying. I I think I think yeah, I think that is what the medrash is hide, hiding. Yeah.
Right. If you think that kid, the fact that this event is connected back to the Akedah reminds us and uh, substantiates for us that Akedah is a fundamental, foundational story and event that many others are drawn back to it and are rooted in it. I would, I would agree 100%. Right, right. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, the, the that that third explanation of the midrash. I find it to be amazing, and I think it it requires a lot, a lot of thought. Because what, also a question: Why did they need the simile? Why did they need the mashal? What was missing from the explanation? But that's another a whole other thing. I think that that third explanation is has tremendous depth to it. That we haven't really, we haven't, we haven't, which I, I have yet to kind of figure out what else it's hiding in there. But that, that could be some food for thought. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, hope everyone has a Shavuot Tov. Hopefully this is something to reflect on. Um, I felt it was good to go. After last week we did something which was so, so political and so, so politically heavy this week to do something which is a lot, a lot more universalistic, something which has very little, uh, you know, that anyone could kind of get on board with it. I thought I'd balance, I, 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 I thought, I, I thought I'd, ba- I thought I'd balance it out. About next, about next week, we'll see what I find in the Midrash. Everyone have a Shavuot Tov. Call to. Will do. Will do. Okay. Later.